Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vals and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 141, we're going to talk about how to convert a balanced signal to unbalanced. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult the professional technician when in doubt. Okay, so we don't work a lot with balanced circuits. And personally, I don't think they belong in home audio, even high-end home audio. And a while back, we did a tube lab on this whole topic. So if you're interested in, you know, what balanced circuits are, pros and cons of using them, go ahead and take a look at that older tube lab. So when our con cubes unbalanced 1 8 inch output jack broke on our second unit, Yep, both of these expensive units have cheap jacks. Here's one of them right here. We desoldered it because I was trying to find a replacement for it because the manufacturer... Yeah, they, they won't supply a replacement. You gotta go through the dealer. Even though they clearly put a piece of junk in these expensive units, you think they would have just said, Jim, we're sorry. I'm gonna toss four of these in an envelope to you. They actually come on a fairly complicated mini little PCB, so mm -hmm. the sub-assembly would be appreciated, A and K. Well, we could have just soldered <laughs> the jack even if they were willing to send that to us, but you know, this is something designed for a standard consumer laptop, not a high-end piece of audio gear. Now, to be fair, we love our con cubes. They are absolutely perfect for what we use them for, and that's basically as a mini base station for our digital source material mm -hmm. for our two listening stations. They're very, very low noise. Yeah, we've got two listening stations, we got two lab benches, and they're constantly moving around to the lab and back into the listening area. Anyways, for those things, they work great. The only weak link, as far as I've ever found, is that jack. And of course, that's the thing we use the most. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's three possible ways out on these units. So that's where the um, the 1 8th used to go before Charles desoldered it. That's the 2.5 which balance which I'm not interested in using. I find 1 8th is too small. Um, love quarter inch jacks yeah, but you know it's a small unit so getting a quarter inch jack in fairness wouldn't be easy. Uh, but it does have a stereo balanced mini XLR connector. Let me get it up close so you can see that thing. And it looks well made and it is well made, at least as far as I can tell. So the only problem is, is that if we come in, come off of that, we've got a balanced signal and our, our whole system is unbalanced. Mm -hmm. So all of our custom gear is. And is there a way to take that that balanced signal and and make it unbalanced? So bring it out as a as an RCA plug. And yes, there is. In most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, you can you can do this little bit of wiring. And I'm going to show you how. So okay. let's just clear the decks. So let's just. I'm going to start the very basics of what a balanced signal is. I'm not going to spend too much time with it, just to get you oriented. So this is this is a balanced stereo pair here. So there's a left channel and a right channel. They're identical to each other, except one carries the left audio signal and one the right. So now you have a stereo pair, right? Yep. Okay, everybody got that. So this is called the non-inverting part of a balanced pair. And this is the inverting portion. So you can see the signal is positive here, negative here, negative here, positive here. So that's how one channel of audio is carried. Now that could be a microphone. It could be um, the left channel on your home audio. It doesn't matter. So, and of course the microphone could be, it could be a mono microphone or it could be a stereo, in which case you'd have a pair of these, right? So what does that actually look like as a wire though? Well, you'd have a left positive, you'd have a ground, which is also a shield. I should say it differently. I should say there's a shield that also works as the ground return path and a left negative. 
And the same thing exactly for the right channel. Okay, uh, I think everybody's caught up with that. Now, what can you do to steal an unbalanced signal? So let's get out a prop, it'll help a little bit. So here's the actual cable that we made up. Now let's back out a little bit so you can see it. So here is the mini XLR, five pin. So it's a stereo XLR. And, and here is a pair of RCA patch cords. And this is the cable that we get the signal out of our con cube. But if you had, let's say a preamp stage and you wanted to, that had XLR outs only, uh, or you damaged uh, the other output, doesn't matter. Um, you can make up a cable like this yourself or have a custom made cable done up for you. So this here at this end is going to be, we have to choose, is going to be, let's say a left positive and a right positive. So you might think, Jim, you've only got half the audio signal. Well, we, we've only got half the available audio signal, but we've got the full audio signal itself, the original signal. So you can't take a left positive and a right negative. They're going to cancel each other out, but you can take a left positive and a right positive, and you can combine the shield ground return path. And I've got a wire here, so this will help you a little bit more understand that. So there is your left channel, your right channel, and there's the shield that's also the ground return path. And that is these three wires here. Now, uh, by convention, I just pull off the, the positive phase. But you can do it the other way. You can, without any difference whatsoever, you can pull the the left negative and the right negative. You just have to make sure you take both negatives or both positives. You don't want to have a mixed signal. Now, this is looks fairly easy, but it gets a little bit more complicated. So let's take a look at the sketch and let's just zoom in as much as we can. That way, Jim. <laughs> um, this is the side of our con cube. So that's this right here. You can see the connector. So all was well and good when I first, when I did my first test a, a long time ago, I, I actually tested this a long time ago and somebody online provided the mini XLR uh, pinout. Well, it didn't, it didn't work. And I thought, well, something's not working right with this unit. So I, I gave up on it. And then Charles did some research and he realized that this is not the standard industry standard mini five pin mini xlr output is it charles well it's not the the standard pinout for it the plug is the same yes but uh astle and Kern have done something a little bit different here they reversed two and three and they reversed one and four <laughs> so they've essentially flipped the standard pinout so there's two reasons why they could have done that one well, it might have been an accident. <laughs> it might have been a mistake at the factory or at the design stage, and they just built it that way. Or they might have wanted you to have to use a proprietary cable, Yeah, which would be a very big no-no in my book. Uh, we don't know what it was, but you know, so, it did trip us up trying to make this adapter. <laughs> yep, so we had to, it only took you, what, two minutes to resolder the connections. Yeah, thankfully. So, yeah, and thankfully somebody in Japan, I think, put, no, it was in Japanese, the... In the, it was a review, actually, of the Con Cube. Yeah, I think. somebody had figured it out already and put up a nice, uh, nice picture showing the pinout. Yeah, very, very clearly with the cables and everything, so you could get completely oriented because it is easy to get turned around. Yep. And get your wires reversed. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so, be careful if you're going to do this. Make sure you find out what your actual gears pinout is because. They may have done something funky. Now, they shouldn't have, but A and K did, and they're you know that's top top gear for digital music players. So, and if you're buying replacement connectors, say this is an example of what we use to make our adapter here for the XLR five pin. 
This one actually has pin numbers right on the adapter, although you're probably not going to be able to make that out on camera. I can hardly see them. And they, of course, are sticking to the, the correct standard. However, if you're trying to wire it up to the con cube, it's going to be flipped from that. So make sure you pay attention to where the, the wires actually have to go and not where the pin numbers are because it's going to be reversed. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for doing that work, Charles, because what was the one thing after all this frustration and I, I got to admit, I was a little pissed off at Astle and Kern. Um, maybe a little more, <laughs> just a little bit. Um, what was the thing that was a surprise to us? Oh, it seemed like the sound actually improved out of that connector. The clarity improved. And we th there's actually a big diagram. I'm not going to put it on air, but there's a big diagram showing the signal chain. And what happens with the XLR out is, is actually... I believe, according to what they're saying, it's actually earlier before uh, a whole amplifier stage inside the NK. So there was some distortion being introduced probably yeah. from the internal amplifiers. We don't need those amps. We've got our own preamp to boost the signal. So, mm -hmm. so anyways, every, every, all is right in the world uh, in our home audio. <laughs> a little bit of frustration and some broken jacks led to some interesting discoveries. And, uh, and you know, this is... Uh, Something that we can pass on to you. Yeah, so it's fair. It's actually fairly easy to do. Just document what you're trying to do, and get your pins marked correctly. Get yourself all oriented. And if you do, if you're working with a mini XLR, you're going to have to have soldering skills because you've got to work with very small wires. And there's all different versions of them too. So make sure you get the correct pin out for your plug, for your equipment, everything, and then you can make up your cable. Yeah, a lot of modern gear, though preamps in particular, even DAX, use the standard XLR connectors, which are much bigger, much easier to work with. Oh, they're beefy. <laughs> they're beefy. And I like beefy. Okay, well... What's been happening over at Melatone Kits? Well, let's get that off the table and okay. let's take a look. Well, I've shown this before. This is the MacGyvered prototype two gain stage board for what will become the new universal uh, phono kit phono preamp. And it sounds amazing even in this funky kind of MacGyvered uh, slap together prototype board. And Charles designed a new board and they came in and we've got them already in the unit. We've been listening to them and we had some important questions, but first let's just take a look at the board. Look at how well organized this thing is. It's robust. It's nice. We always make nice, big, heavy boards with the, Two ounce traces? Two, two ounce copper and as thick of a trace as we can get away with while still being able to route them. So the boards look fantastic, but the question is, how do they sound? Well, they sound amazing. We were really, well, I should say, you know, the, the universal phono preamp is my baby and I was concerned that we might lose some of the musicality and the dynamics with the new board design. No, we've got all of that stayed. And the next big, huge question is, what about the noise floor? Because Charles really spends a lot of time routing traces around. We go over it together routing traces, moving things a millimeter. <laughs> Trying to keep the signal path as clean as possible away from sources of noise and um, trying to make it easy to build on too. But the the signal path routing really has a big advantage on these. Yeah, and when we went to check to see what the noise floor was, I think we we figured it came, we dropped it in half. Somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, before... We put in the new boards. I, the noise floor was, I would call it good. Mm -hmm. But I would probably say that it was just barely into the good category because phono preamps have an enormous amount of gain. And getting rid of every little bit of noise in that chassis is its quite a bit of trick. It's, it's, it's a bit of engineering, a bit of design, a bit of build, a bit of science. 
and it's also almost like an art form because you're moving wires a little tiny bit this way and that way you're adding some extra filtering on certain stages even on the heater supply yeah and um to go f to go from what we thought was good to uh, about twice as good <laughs> <laughs> twice as good is i would call it great anyways that i mean that's probably the one thing that has had me worried more than anything once we got the design to the point where where we had something that sounded amazing um and, and i i also wanted to have that to get rid of that noise that's that was um um just barely below the threshold and the interesting thing is when you when you when you keep shoving the noise floor lower and lower the quiet passages get clearer and clearer even though from your listening position you can't hear that noise floor in fact when we listen for the noise floor in the original prototype we have to bring our ears right up into the speakers oh, yeah. we're, we're inches away from it yeah at a normal listening volume um and uh uh, when you're in your seating position, of course, you can't hear anything. And, and be careful if you do that for yourself, that no sound is going to come through those speakers. It's an easy way to, to make yourself deaf. <laughs> yeah, we we both have sort of a, a cautionary protocol in which even though we're probably both present in the listening area and working, um, nobody goes near the volume knob, nobody goes near a switch, nobody's near a checking tube. Nobody's tube for microphonics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's basically hands off, stand back from the system because, you know, we rely on our on our ears so much and we need to maintain a really good level of hearing. So if we had an accident, it could be a disaster yeah. for one of us. Protect your hearing, folks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for making those new boards, Charles. And in a future episode, we're going to do some more listening. And in fact, we're getting really close to calling test builders. We're getting close to it. Yep. So, Stay tuned for that. I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Well, we've got some interesting tubes that came in. What have you got, okay. Charles? Let me get those over here. Let's see if I can get these all on camera in one shot. So let's start from your left to your right. We've got in some more of these beautiful 5U4 Svetlana equivalents. And I believe these are the 5U3Cs. And this of course is the black plate version. Now the black plates I think we, we figured were the earliest types, but they did make them simultaneously for, for some time with what's called the gray plate version, mm -hmm. which is a little bit different. We were looking at the plates just yesterday or the day before, and there's some minor variations in the mica and the manufacturer. Yeah, just a plates. little bit of a difference. And and they changed the, uh, the getter holder too. The older ones all have these sort of angled plate foil which getters. Which is pretty unique, but common in the very early Soviet tubes. Mm -hmm. And later on, they switched to the standard saucer one that you see in just about all of them. But what's really interesting about this one right here, and this is a new old stock tube, and it's dated 1952. So this is an incredibly old new old stock rectifier. Look at this interesting Svetlana logo. Let me see if I can get that properly on camera. So we've got the Svetlana Wing C with a tube inside of it. And I don't think we've ever seen that before. That might be the earliest Svetlana label. Or one of the earliest. This is really interesting and it's neat looking and we have a whole bunch of these matched up. Uh, I think ranging from the 1950s to the 1970s. All new old stock and, and ready to roll. Yeah, this we got a, almost a full case in uh, of mixed tubes. What happens a lot with suppliers in um, Eastern Europe is they'll gather up as much of a certain type of tube that, as they know that I'm interested in or we're interested in and um, they're just thrilled to find any new old stock black plates so we'll end up with a, a case a ship case of 1952 in this case yeah. I think the oldest tube was 1969 or something like that both of them most of them were in the early 60s and, and in the late 50s yeah so that's pretty nice to find and we've got in some more of these really nice 7193s and these are the double top cap single triodes and the 7193 is in the cb6 family cb6 right? and 2c22 there's probably 
you know, almost a dozen names for these different tubes because all the allies use them, just like we talked about in, I think it was a couple episodes ago. And, uh, but they're all basically the same. They're all tube. basically the same tube. They're all single triodes that were meant for radar use. And the Kenrads tend to be some of the more popular ones out there. So we've got some beautiful new old stock examples in like this guy. Let me get it in focus. And it's nice to find them with the bases in this condition. Uh, sometimes they're cracked, sometimes the labels are worn. So this is just absolutely beautiful. And so are the boxes for them too. There's one of those great military boxes. And you can see that it was made by Kenrad for Hazeltine Service Corporation. I guess they probably had a military contract at some point and, and they got the tubes made by Kenrad. So we've got one of those and we have a couple of interesting nine pins. Now we've been talking a lot lately about the 6GU7 and this of course is its cousin, the 6CG7, which is the much more well-known version because it is the direct nine pin equivalent of a 6SN7. Whereas the 6GU7 has a, a, a... It's a small difference in specs. I think the mu is three less or minus. Something like that. 20 yeah. versus 17, which is almost negligible. Now, we've tended to avoid picking up these tubes because just like the 6SN7, there is a huge variety in them. It's very hard to match them up. It's hard to find them in large lots. But we were lucky enough to find a lot of these beautiful RCA clear tops. And anybody that knows anything about RCA knows that the clear top version of their tubes, they're sought after. They're rare. They and tend I, to be great and sounding. I, and I wonder why. I wonder if the clear tops were pretty much all made in the Hartford factory and there's some mojo that was going on in that factory. Something was going on. Something was going on and these are really hard to find but we managed to find a whole bunch and we've got some match pairs in the store of them now. So these are some beautiful tubes and it's another great 6SN7 replacement if you want to get some 9 pin to octal adapters or you can run them in an amplifier that was meant to take them. Excellent. Well thanks for, you found those. Thanks a lot for for doing that, Charles. I'm still amazed that we can find some really beautiful new old stock tubes. Um, and we've got some really great stuff coming in large quantities. So the this segment's going to be more interesting. But the dock workers are threatening to go on strike <laughs> as of Saturday morning at 10 a.m., I think. And we've got stuff sitting in customs now that's been there for how long? Two to three weeks at least. I think the yeah. little buggers have already done a work slowdown. <laughs> so anyways, um, who knows? Eventually everything does come through. So yeah. just have to be patient. So if you stayed this long, here's some discount codes to help you out. And there's a hidden code that quite a few of you get. And there's a huge code for a larger order and nobody's used it. Somebody guessed it once. Thank goodness, because that's going to cost us the big money. And we've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world, and we can reach almost everybody. But if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on us. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.